hello everyone and today we are talking to Mr. Larry Pal, the decorator of uh, the what am I talking about? The director of the American Institute of Pyramid Research. He runs the website greatpyramid.org and greatpyramid.us. He is a brilliant researcher, in my opinion. He has made many discoveries at Giza. He has a, a very good YouTube channel, uh, which uh, needs more views. It's called The Great Pyramid, AIP. Check it out. We're talking to Larry. Larry, uh, would you like to uh, firstly just, just introduce yourself quickly and, and give us a, uh, you've just been to Giza, give us a rundown on your latest uh, discovery and, and some of the things you do. I know you do tours as well. Yeah, you know, uh, it's an honor to be on with you, uh, Dr. Charles Coase. Uh, I have, uh, you know, followed you and, and uh, have always enjoyed your your uh, uh, eclectic range of, of topics and subjects. And so, uh, you know, I'm honored that you w would want to talk with me. And and uh, and so, yes, I just uh, I just came back from Giza. I was there uh, uh, October 22nd through November 5th. And uh, I had uh, what I call the October Adventure. So I invited people to come with me on an adventure, not a tour. A tour is, you know, you, you get a five-star hotel, you float down the Nile in a nice cruise ship, you know. I do those because, you know, people like, like those tours. But this I called the October Adventure because I said – this is not five-star hotels. This is you joining me in some real research. Don't come if you're not interested in that. This is some of this is kind of the research agenda. This is some of the things we'll do. And Charles, I had uh, seriously about 20 serious interests, 20 people that, that wanted to come, but because of COVID, so many people had to drop out. It was just one after another. So it ended up being two people came with, which which I was glad. I was going to do the research trip myself I, 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 because I had a tour uh, in November that was canceled. A, a tour that I had I had you know, set up long before COVID. It was on the schedule. And even when COVID hit in March or April, you know, I thought, well, November, you know, that by then everything will be cleared up. Well, obviously we get closer to November and it was plain that the tour had to be canceled. So what I did was when I canceled the regular tour, I thought, well, I'm going to do a research adventure. Okay. If I can't take my, you know, my tour, I'll just go myself. And I did, I bought my ticket and, and I was going to go myself. And then I realized, why don't I invite some people to go with me? And that's how the 20 people got interested, which was whittled down to two. And so two 20-somethings uh, came with me on the October adventure, and that's what I just came back from. So, you know, uh, the first, I got there a day before they did. So I, I always go into the Great Pyramid, one of the first things I do. I just, I, you know, I've been in there so many times. And I took my equipment with me, and it was probably a mistake. You know, I had my, my laser measure and uh, lighting equipment because I wanted to take some, a bunch of videos up in the King's Chamber of the Great Pyramid. Uh, perhaps, as you know, uh, my friend Robert Grant was a student of da Vinci and uh, found out that da Vinci was in Egypt uh, that, and uh, that actually the backdrop of the Last Supper is the King's Chamber. It, it's undeniable. I could just prove it, just do an overlay. So da Vinci encoded the Great Pyramid in the Last Supper. And Robert Grant found some things on the walls in the king's chamber that he knew were there because of da Vinci's painting. So we, when he went, he, he, led a, he led an expedition the same time I did. I had what was called the, uh, the Egypt Leap 2020, hashtag Egypt Leap. It was in it was February, and Robert Grant led a tour uh, 2020 Alpha Omega was his hashtag. So we both had research expeditions in Egypt in February. So we both were taking photos and stuff and studying the king's chamber in February. And again, Robert Grant discovered the eye of Horus on the north wall. He discovered uh, the Taurus bull uh, and the Apis bull on the uh, on the uh, the north wall, the, the west wall is where he discovered the eye of Horus. And he discovered some things on the sarcophagus. And again, he knew those things were there by studying Da Vinci's The Last Supper. Okay, so now back to me and, and the beginning of the October adventure. I'm there the day before my kids come, my 20 somethings, and I'm up there taking footage because we've learned, uh, if you look at my most recent uh, Instagram post, I show some close-ups of the rose granite that characterizes the King's Chamber. And it's 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 not like slick and polished, it's kind of rough and, and uh, it's dark up in the King's Chamber. There's a few fluorescent lights the Egyptian government puts up there. So it's hard to see things. So 
we found that you often see things when you take the footage, you go home and look at it. Like you don't see it at the time, but then when you're reviewing footage, things pop up because it, it's just, again, I, I this last post I did on Instagram, I did to show people what, like, well, how come you can't just see it? How come it's not just there? I don't know. It's it's kind of mysterious. It's it, it's the way that the light hits the rose granite. It's like a science we haven't fully figured out yet. So, so I was taking all this footage up there. So that would have been, I think, October 23rd. And uh, so the authorities came up and said, you can't do that. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. And so I knew that when I went out, because they were very friendly to me up in the King's Chamber, but I thought, as soon as I go out, they're going to grab my cameras. They're going to, they're going to take me to the police, you know, and sure that that's, that's what happened. So, so long story short, I had to delete all the video I'd taken up there. I had special lighting up there, you know, taking uh, videos of the North wall, the West wall, the sarcophagus, you know, I had to delete all of it. I had a GoPro. I had a GoPro right here on this hat. I had a belt on here that I had to go. So I had a GoPro. I had GoPro footage. I had iPhone footage. I had, you know, so, so they deleted all of it. And, uh, and I had to sign a statement. The guy actually writes a statement on the desk in the police office there where, or, uh, you know, uh, I, Larry Paul promise to not, you know, post anything on social media or in any scientific publication from that day. And I'm thinking, I got no problem signing this cause you just deleted everything. And I, I'm not one of these guys where I have, you know, I got backups so I can fool them. Like, yeah, I deleted all my stuff, but really, you know, I know some people do that. They've got a way to, you know, they can, get, I, I don't, I, when they took the footage, it's gone. I, I didn't have some sophisticated backup plan for how I really, you know, posted these things on some, you know, uh, cloud service unbeknownst to the authorities. So it was easy for me to sign the statement saying I wouldn't use them on social media because I deleted all of them. So that wasn't a good start because now I've got my young 20 somethings coming the next day. And, and, uh, they were, they knew that part of their research was going to be doing the same kind of thing. You know, uh, up in the king's chamber taking pictures you know angles putting light different way oh look there's an alpha and omega because there is there is an alpha and omega up there on the, on the uh south west corner of the sarcophagus it's a very plain alpha and omega the question is just when when was it put there and so uh i actually had them go up there the next day without me i didn't want the association with me and so they did get take pictures and photographs they weren't stopped because they're not on the radar like i am so <clears throat> So then later uh, that week, I, I paid to bring a tripod, and you can pay at the gate to, to bring a tripod into the Giza Plateau. And I do it because I make some videos, you know. So I, I set up by uh, the uh, south side of the Great Pyramid, and, and I, I made what I thought was a really good video. It's, it's on Instagram. It was the one I, where I talked about how, you know, we need independent researchers like me. We need Egyptologists like Mark Lehner and all the people that slam Zahi Awas and Mark Lehner as being, you know, they're withholding it. And it, it, get over that. They're they're real researchers, you know. That, and that, so that's the video I made. Just when I was finishing that video where I talked about the need to have both independent researchers and forensic scientists like Dr. Mark Lehner, who's been a forensic scientist for 40 years on Giza and has found the, the breweries and the bakeries of the people that built the pyramids. I'm sorry, but he has. I'm sorry for those of you in the alternative community that think he's lying or something, but he's got 40 years of research digging the spade into the soil in the conservative way that archaeologists work, showing... Uh, can, I, can I stop you there, sir? Sure. Uh, are you talking about... Because I... I... To, to my mind, only the Menkore uh, Pyramid City has been found. The, you know, they're they're finding uh, some of the Khufu underneath that. And uh, <clears throat> I don't think Mark has published all of that. But he just, I just got invited to a <clears throat> private talk that he gave uh, <clears throat> Dr. Lehner. And he talked about all the evidence they have of the harbors <clears throat> that uh, Khufu built and that, you know, that that came up to uh, the causeways and in, in, up near the pyramids. So they leveraged, you know, the Nile to move stone in there. So they, they do have that, and that's plainly related to Khufu and the Khufu's uh, architect, not Hemiunu, who was the architect of the building of the Great Pyramid, but the the uh, architect uh, who's got a huge tomb on the in the eastern field there, uh, his name is Ankh, Ankhaf. The, 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 uh, the, the, uh, uh, the architect Ankhaf was the one involved with the harbors and stuff. So you have a very strong connection between actual fourth dynasty people and, and, and uh, great industrial works that were done in this case, the harbors. So, you know, there's that with Khufu. 
uh, it, it's true that that uh, the, the, there, there, there's not as much found of the uh, of the Khufu. It is it is Menkara and, and Khafre. But again, I think that they're they're finding another level now where they're beginning to find that. So, so fair you know, enough. No. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So so back to so so uh, so now they're around me saying, <clears throat> you know, you you can't do that. I said, what do you mean? I paid here. I, I pulled the ticket. Out. I paid for the I paid for the tripod. You know, people. There's people. There's tourists all around us taking pictures and photos. You're not you know, videos. You're not saying anything to them. And I thought to myself, I'm going to take a stand here. I, the reason I let them take the footage from the king's chamber because I knew you're not supposed to measure things. And I had a laser measure, so I thought I broke the rules. I need to suffer the consequences. All right, I let them take. But in this case, I'm not breaking any rules. So I thought to myself, I'm just going to walk out. I'm going to walk past, past the Sphinx and go out the gate. And and I'm I just I'm just going to say, arrest me, arrest me. And so so you know they're being sort of nice, but talking to me. And I just said, no, I'm I'm not going to give you that footage. And a couple guys grabbed me. They put their hands on my shoulder. And I said, get your hands off of me. And I started walking toward the gate. So that you know freaked them out a little bit. So I knew that they would call up to the gate. So I'm and I'm walking out. Down, you know, you're up near the Great Pyramid, you're walking down toward the Sphinx and out toward the Sphinx Gate, because that's I had an apartment right outside there. And I knew that there would be ready for me down there because the guys would call, hey, you know, this guy. And sure enough, I get down, there's 10 policemen, you know, waiting. And I thought, I'm just going to pull the same thing here. I'm just going to go out and make them strong on me. Well, they strong on me. They just grab me. It's plain these guys are not going to let me go. So I yelled something out about the American Embassy and the State Department, like, you can't do this just to, you know, freak them out a little bit because you want to make an international incident. But I, I was I was taking a stand here. It's like I, I gave you the, the, the footage I took up in the King's Chamber because I used a laser measure. And I knew from past times you're not supposed to do that. So if I knowingly break the rules, all right, I've got to suffer the consequences. But in this case, I'm not breaking any rule. And I really liked the video I just made. I knew it was good footage. And I ended up using it. You know, it's it's on my channel. So I took a stand. And after all this yelling and stuff and me saying, arrest me, arrest me, you know, call the State Department, you know, just saying stuff like that. The guy who's like the expert, the, the, the standing on the side, the guy with the tie and everything walks over and he says, sir, you're free to go. And then the nice lady from antiquities who had been talking to me and trying to reason with me and stuff, she said, you're free to go. And I said, yeah, but if I go out right now, I said, I can't come back in because the way they work, once you buy a ticket, if you go out, you can't come back in. I said, I'm going to go out to get rid of all this footage. And then I'm going to want to come back in. She said, oh, you're going to have to pay again. I said, OK, so so the point is, so th that time I didn't give it. So, you know, this I felt like Indiana Jones. I mean, you're fighting with the authorities. You know, I'm pushing guys off. Get your hands off of me. Call the American embassy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but OK, so so the next day I come out there and I'm doing some of the research, you know, that, that you asked about it in, in the, nobody's touching me. You know, I, I think I had my GoPro on because I, I took a risk. I thought, you know, so I brought the cameras back in. I'm taking some photographs, not up in the King's Chamber, but just on the Giza Plateau and had a free hand. So I thought, all right, I want to go in and see the guy that's the director of the pyramids. His name's Ashraf Mohammed. He is the direct. His title is director general of the pyramids. He's got an office in the shadow of the Great Pyramid. He's in charge of all those policemen. He's also the dignitary that like when Melania Trump, uh, the first lady of the United States, came to her Africa tour, he's the one that led her around the pyramid. A German ambassador that just came, Ashraf is the guy. So he's not only the head policeman, but he's also, you know, he's he's the, uh, the, the tourist guy, too. He, big dignitaries come. So he's a powerful man. And I thought, well, I got to go face him because, you know, if I'm going to keep working in Giza... I can't go by, are they going to take my footage or not? You know, where do I stand? It's, I, you know, I thought I, I got to go in and see him. Plus, I wanted to go to the tomb of Nefertiabet, who's the daughter of Khufu, and it's in the restricted part of the Western tombs. And I knew I'd have to get his permission because he's in charge of the Western tomb field. Uh, my friend, Dr. Raid is in charge of the Southern field, and that's where the second Sphinx is. And, I, and he gave me permission to go look at the second Sphinx on this tour. But I knew that Ashra uh, is in charge of the Western field. So, so I went into his office, his secretary said, have a seat. So I'm sitting there praying, you know, just that things work right, you know, okay, you can come in. So I walk into his office, I take my hat off to indicate respect. This is a powerful man. And, you know, long story short, he, he said, yes, that, that uh, 
he, he had told his men to lay off of me. In other words, what I had just experienced and walking around and not having anybody hassle me, he had given the word, let this guy do his stuff. And after scolding me a little bit about the stuff in the sarcophagus up in the king's chamber, he, he mentioned two times he respects my work. And that, that was like a great feeling for me because, you know, the, the fact that he said, I, I respect your work. You know, he, he doesn't believe everything I, you know, just like you don't believe everything I teach, but, you know, you, it's he respects it. So, so after we had this sort of, you know, coming together, then I asked him, I said, hey, can I get your permission to go to the tomb of Nefertiabad? It's G1225. He says, ah, I think that's he, uh, that's under sand, he said. I said, well, I, it could be under sand. I said, I just want to go back there and look at it. He says, yeah, go ahead. So I knew in going back there, I'd get stopped by the guards because you can't go back there. If you tried to go back there, you'd get stopped and you'd get arrested if you went beyond. They stopped me. I just said, Ashraf said I could. Ashraf said I could. Okay, go ahead. So in other words, so and, and the next day, I did the same thing. I came out to the plateau. Nobody's hassling me. I'm taking pictures. I'm walking around, kind of get, taking the GPS readings with my Garmin Instinct. And uh, and Ashraf happened to pass by. He's, he was with, as a matter of fact, Zahi Was and Dr. Mark Lehner got a grant from RC to protect the basalt pavement that's on the east side, the mortuary temple right to the east. People just walk on a tourist and they have for a long time. And of course, it's like precious. You know, it's an ar thing that archaeologists as a country should preserve. It's the type of thing that a country should preserve. So they got this grant to put a walkway around it. So tourists will not be able to walk on that basalt pavement anymore. You know, it's going to and I, and I and I'm sitting there worried because. What else are they going to do? Pretty soon, you're not going to be able to go in the Great Pyramid. You just be able to take a virtual because Zahi Was wanted to do that one time. Let no one up in the Great Pyramid just take a virtual tour, you know, go in a little building and and look at it virtually. And so I thought, crap, what are they? So Ashraf was walking toward me with the I, the guy who I knew was the project director for doing that because they're building it right now. They're building it right now. And probably in a few days, you will not be able to walk on the basalt pavement. There's going to be this wooden wooden walkway. And it was so interesting. There was uh, a big a big stone in the way of where the walkway was supposed to go that tourists will now walk on. And there was like 10 Egyptian guys trying to move this stone. So picture, you know, how did they build the pyramid? So, you know, so here's 10 modern Egyptian laborers trying to move this big stone with no coordination. They didn't know what they were doing. Like, no, move over here. No, no, no do this. Get this. Try this. I asked. <laughs> I asked the head guy if I could take a picture of it because they thought, you know, <laughs> the pyramid would never get built if, the, if these, if, but he, they wouldn't give me permission because it's a concession that they have to build this. You know, anytime it's a concession, you can't take pictures. You know, they, any all archaeological sites are protected by the Egyptian government. You can't just walk on there like Saqqara where they just found the 27 tombs. We tried to get, you can't get anywhere near that. I mean, anytime there's, so... Anyways, they wouldn't let me take pictures, but I, since I had asked the guy, I knew he was the head guy. And so here's Ashraf walking with me with the head guy. And I said, Ashraf, and I started telling him that I wanted to go back to the tomb because I had forgotten to check some things. And he said, Larry, I'm busy. What do you want? In other words, he's telling me, cut to the chase. Stop your long explanation. I just said, can I go back to the tomb? He goes, go ahead. So at least for now, you know, and I did go back there, and this time I got a police escort because I went back there, and the police stopped me. I said, Ashraf said I could. So they got to call him. I thought, oh, no, I'm going to get in trouble because I know he's busy. He just told me he's busy. They're going to call him, and in his busyness, he's, what are you asking me that for? You know, what? But they called him, and he said, yeah, go ahead. So I got a police escort this time to, to the tomb of Nefertiabet because Ashraf had given me permission. And so now the police, instead of hassling me, are now my bodyguards. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So, but then they wouldn't let me take pictures. So that was the downside. You know, they were, I got the escort, but I couldn't take pictures where if I would have just been there myself, I probably would have. But so yeah, so that's some of the Indiana Jones stuff that I, that I go through there. Now you made a, you made a, a, a discovery. Would you like to tell us about the discovery you've recently made that the quadrants, I believe on the east side well, of the. Yeah. yeah uh, let's see. Why don't I try and share my screen with you here? Uh, yep. Okay, so I'm just sharing a picture. What I asked uh, Skype to do was share a picture. So that's a picture I took. You can see my boots there. You can see my iPhone, and you can see that quadrant. Now, this is the type of marking that I uh, study on the east and north side, especially of the Great Pyramid. 
I presented uh, papers at large Egyptological conferences the last two years on such marks. And so I made a video about this one, a short Instagram video, if you look at my Instagram account, in which I said, you know, I just took a picture of it. And I said, I know based on my past work, when I put this onto Google Earth and take it back home, and it's going to yield something. Just because I, I, I just know based on past, based on my experience with these things. And sure enough, uh, can you see the mouse pointing there? Oh, yeah. Okay, so... So this, this, the Great Pyramid's back here. It's back here. This, so this is east. This mark is basically pointing to the Great Pyramid. Now, I took uh, angle readings with my iPhone here, you know, bearings, basically. You know, this was probably an eastern bearing, and this is probably a north or northeastern bearing. And then I, you know, take, and, I, and then I marked the GPS points. So I, I went to my Garmin, and I got a GPS reading for this point. <clears throat> So, and I showed it to uh, uh, Alan at Sacred Geometry Decoded. He, he commented on it, and he asked what the dimensions were, you know. And uh, I told him, well, this one right here is 28. It's about 28 inches, that, that right there. And this is 21 inches. Now, you can see this is not an exact drawing. This isn't perfectly drawn with a fine number two pencil on an engineering slate. It's, it's carved into the rock. It's rough. But... All Egyptologists recognize that these markings are part of the original, you know, pavement. The, the, the people that built the Great Pyramid, this is their work. This is not some graffiti somebody put in here. I'm, I'm just going by what the archaeologists say in saying that. All these markings, John Romer's written a book about it. Mark Lehner's written about the marks that are there. So 28 and 21, well, those are the dimensions of the Great Pyramid. You know, 1411. You know, it's uh, it's uh, 14 wide, 11 high. It's the it's the 280, 440. It's it's the dimensions of the Great Pyramid, and it's got this intimation of being a circle here because it's a quadrant. So when I laid this out, this line right here points exactly to the center of the Great Pyramid. Now that's not by chance. This the the 28 and the 21 is not by chance, and pointing directly to the center of the Great Pyramid is not by chance. And so, to me, the discovery, Charles, and somebody might not call this a discovery, but I call it a discovery because I think there was an intentionality by the people that put this mark on the plateau. There was intentionality. And I'm uncovering part of the intentionality, and I consider that a discovery. <clears throat> it's, like you, it's like the Rosetta Stone kind of thing, because I do think I'm discovering a language here. So the language here is, this has something to do with a circle or a quadrant. Now, a circle, uh, you know, if you go to Marty Leeds' channel, he says, square is the earth, circle is heaven. Ancient symbolism, he says. The square, that's earth, circle, that's heaven. That's an ancient meaning, he'll tell you. So so this something has to do with heaven and earth because it's also got these squares. And so the fact that this points directly to the center of the Great Pyramid. Now, I mentioned to Charles earlier when we were talking that uh, uh, Jean-Paul Beval, Robert Beval's brother, uh, Gary Osborne, uh, a great researcher on the Great Pyramid, some other people I could name are all saying that the eight-sided Great Pyramid points to a sphere that was at the top of it. It points to a sphere. And so what I'm saying is that that mark that I just showed you is circle-like and sphere-like. And so it's pointing to the center of the Great Pyramid where these re researchers say a sphere it, it was to be there. You know, Gary Osborne says it as he's a great researcher. Uh, uh, Jean-Paul Beval says it, that, that a virtual sphere is contemplated by following the indented lines on the four faces. They say that architecturally a sphere is sort of demanded. So I'm saying, I, you know, I'm, I'm not the, the great, I don't have the skill of the architects like those guys do. They're, they're both great uh, graphic artists too, like they can draw. But my stuff is more rough, but but it's the roughness of the fourth dynasty builders themselves. That quadrant I showed you points to the center of the Great Pyramid, and it's sphere-like because it's giving the intimation of a circle or a sphere, and it's saying that way. So to me, this is sort of a confirmation on the plateau that the sphere that John Paul Beval and Gary Osborne and others, Manu Sefzada, are seeing, That's that, and, and I'm saying... Yes, and this is kind of proof that it's not by chance, as the Egyptologists would say, well, that's just, you know, a coincidence. No, 
this mark says to me, they're pointing up there and saying there's something circleish, there's something spherish about the center of the Great Pyramid. So you know I what? consider that a, I consider that a discovery. Whether you or anybody else does, that's fine. But I consider that a discovery. <laughs> Larry, that's an amazing discovery, um, and it, it 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 totally backs up uh, what people have been saying. The Great Pyramid, by its dimension, screams out pi. It screams out I am a circle. Um, you 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 know probably of the work of Staccini, who said that the the Great Pyramid is a model of the Northern Hemisphere. Yeah. Uh, and in addition. Uh, I know, Indeed, and in addition, I know that the uh, there was an Etruscan pyramid which had a, a, a great sphere on top or a sphere with another pyramid and then another sphere, uh, which the Romans demolished, unfortunately. Yeah. This is backing up all the previous work, and you're finding more evidence for this. Yeah, and there I, I saw I, I, one of those guys shows uh, some hieroglyphics that show a... Uh, like a stand and then a, and a sphere on it, you know, and that they seem to think that's what was at the top of the Great Pyramid. And again, there is arch, there is hieroglyphic evidence of that kind of thing. Like, what is that? There's a there's this standard and then a, a sphere on it. So yeah, yeah, and and uh, absolutely. And and um, so to me, um, you know, th th there's no question about this. But I I don't follow the conservative principles of the archaeologists. And that's fine. They do because that's their science. And uh, I respect them. But as an independent researcher, I can bring in theology. I remember you, when you said it's a circle. I remember watching your video in which you said the Great Pyramid says, I'm a circle. You yes. know, that, I remember you said that. And I that, that touched me when you said that. I thought that's true. It, 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 is, it is saying I'm a circle. And because uh, you know, it does square the circle, you know, as, as you know. And, and uh, so, yeah. That's awesome. Uh, now, uh, we've been going 27 minutes. Do you have time for some more questions? Well, why don't we do one more thing? You had, you had mentioned a couple uh, other areas in my research. Why don't, why don't I just pick on one? Go so pick, pick, pick one of those others. You had, you had mentioned a list of them to me at the beginning, and like Fibonacci, the uh, Orion, uh, Unified Giza. Why don't you pick one of those, and I'll say something about Fibonacci. About that. I'm curious about that. Fibonacci, okay. So, you know, people that – I'm not a mathematician, but, uh, you know, I, I read Graham Hancock's – said that studying the Great Pyramid drove him to study mathematics. And uh, I think, you know, people look up to Graham Hancock anyways, and here he is saying that, and that's the same with me. I, you know, I hated math in school, but the Great Pyramid is driving me to be a greater mathematician and sacred geometry and all that. It's like, because it's there. And so I want to be a better man. The Great Pyramid's making me a better man because I, I want to study this. So, so those of you that are mathematicians know the Fibonacci, you know, series of numbers. And of course, we know that it's in sunflower, again, it's in pine cones, it's in nautilus shells, it's in uh, storm centers, it's in galaxies. You know, the principle of the 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, you know, that principle is the principle of growth in nature. Sacred Geometry Decoded talks about how in nature, when, when, a, uh, when a sunflower seed gets a little bit off, or maybe it gets sick or the pine cone gets a disease, that it's self-correcting because it it can it corrects itself. So it's a it's the golden ratio. The Fibonacci numbers in, or the golden ratio that's so much of you know uh, Grecian and other building is built on the you know 1.618 ratio, the perfect you know the building. So it's the Fibonacci has the golden numbers built into it, the golden ratio. But it's also got this idea that I got from you know sacred geometry Dakota that in, in nature it includes it heals itself too. So it's the, the number of growth and healing. So th there is a Fibonacci spiral that goes through all the center of all three Giza pyramids. Now that cannot be by chance. If you take three things on your desk, a stapler, a piece of tape, and something else, the chances of them being in a Fibonacci spiral the way you laid them out, you know, one in a million. So the fact that the three Giza pyramids are in uh, a Fibonacci spiral that that shouts intentionality, and as a matter of fact, it goes through the the second of Menkara satellite pyramids. It goes through the center of that, so it goes through the center of four pyramids. So if you follow that around, it goes to an origin. Now Fibonacci, you know, is got eternity built into it because the beginning of it, the origin, keeps going forever, and it also spirals out forever. So it's got infinity at the end and infinity at the beginning. And to me, as an independent researcher, that speaks of 
you know, eternal, eternal life, the things that the pharaohs were looking for, the, you know, resurrection, the, you know, the next life, the mummification, you know, theology. That, so that's kind of all wrapped up. So I wanted to take a expedition to the origin of the Fibonacci spiral. And I did. I've done it several times. I've actually been to the, the origin four times now. And every one of them was magical. It's just, you know, and, and it's not something that I could franchise. If I, if I want to take tours there or something, you can't. It's, it's restricted. You got to go. There's a guard you got to get through. And it's, you, you got to, there's a wall you have to climb to get there. It's like, do I have permission to do this? You know, and so it's not something I could take a tour on. But the small groups I've taken four times. And I've got a video online where I showed the, the first time I was with, it was actually the second time I was with Will Wire, uh, a great graphics artist from Boulder, and uh, my son Orion, who's a great photographer. And like birds came. If you see them, birds, they weren't afraid of us. They came right to us. And it was like they were telling us where it was, like we we're following birds. Like, it, it, like that sounds crazy, but that's what happened. So that's an example of me studying the Fibonacci origin because it's the origin of the actual Fibonacci spiral that goes through the center of four of the Giza pyramids, the second Menkara and then Menkara, Khafre, and Khufu. So that had to be intentional. You don't just accidentally lay out three pyramids on a Fibonacci spiral. So uh, th that that's a, a sort of a mystical maybe piece of my research because I mean you as a mathematician you could just say well here's the point this point is the be this is the beginning of the spiral okay just that spot right there you know nothing mystical about that but somehow it's been mystical in some way each time we've gone there maybe there's some uh, earth energy there or, or yeah, some... oh, uh, yeah Rob Roberto the the uh, the Cuban board guy the twenty something kid that was with me. He's real attuned to that. He had, while he was in Egypt, he bought, you know, uh, uh, some, uh, uh, you know, stones that were, uh, you know, the, the special, what do they call them, uh, uh, crystals. He, he bought all the crystals for the different chakras and stuff. He's into that. He's a high energy person. And he was, he was, he was almost tripping the energy he felt there. You know, he, he was, he just, he, 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 he just. He wanted to go back like the next day. I mean, it was like so, you know, powerful for him. Now, you know, some people are more that way than others, you know, but he was really feeling it, you know, and, and uh, some people do, do that when they go to the Bent Pyramid. When you go to that, uh, uh, you know, that that corner, that's the, uh, it'd be the uh, northwest corner. People say they feel an energy at the Bent Pyramid. There's a certain stone where they stand you as you're, you know, you're, you're park and then you walk toward the Bent Pyramid to go in it. You know, about halfway there, there's a spot that people that feel that they can feel an energy there at the Bend Pyramid. It's, it's sort of like that. You know, he was definitely feeling it. So, yeah, a high energy spot. Not everyone would experience that. But Roberto just he, he just was like tripping. <laughs> well, that's and, and, and just the experience we had with him. Uh, you know, I, I could explain the whole thing, but there, there were, uh, it was, there was more involved, and it, it's just uh, interesting. So, so maybe that's a more of a more of a, 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 a esoteric part of my research, the, the Fibonacci spiral and origin. Uh, that's uh, for you. That's esoteric. For me, that's uh, very, uh, very conservative. <laughs> 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 but uh, you know, uh, but uh, Larry. You know, uh, I guess we'll we'll start to wrap it up. Uh, yeah. Larry, it's such an honor to talk to you. To my mind, you, you're a great archaeologist and a great adventurer, and uh, I love your research. And we have to. There's so much more I, I want to ask you about. Yeah, we well, have let's, to do, let's do some other sessions because I want to talk to you about some stuff too. So let's just plan to do yeah. another one sometime here. We will. Let's do it. And um, okay. I'll let you get to your to your uh, to your next appointment. Yeah. Thank you so much. And. Um, We'll talk again soon. Okay, great. Thanks, Charles. Good talking to you.